Welcome to the first edition of How Do I Paint It? My name is Kip Schauger, and I am the Tech Director, Scene Designer for the Ball State University College of Fine Arts Department of Theater. I will be your host in this series. In this video, we will be examining some very simple yet basic stage painting techniques for scenery. This overview might include basic color theory, painting supplies and tools, Painting techniques such as cross hatching, glazing, dry brushing, stippling, spattering, feather dusting, paint stamping, and finishing. Also, some special techniques like stenciling, marbling, wood graining and brick painting. Finally, we'll be illustrating these examples by going on stage and looking at a completed set. We'll examine the painting techniques found on that set to show you that you too can come up with some very professional looking yet economical stage painting techniques so you can helpfully answer the question, how do I paint it? Let's begin. In this particular video, we want to show you some very easy yet economical and innovative scenic painting techniques that really has some fantastic results as far as stained scenery and the audience viewpoint is concerned. But before we go that far, I thought we better start off a little bit by talking about color. Because color is the single most important element as far as the audience view is concerned. When the curtain goes up, the first thing they see is the color of the scenery. What I have before you down here are some sets that will record our ideas of what we want our colors of our scenery to look like. For example, we can have a realistic set with realistic colors. We can have a stylistic set and using a stylistic fashion for our colors. Or we can have something almost a cartoon fashion and use brighter, bolder colors. What we're dealing with here is the idea that color will do certain things for you. Color is said to have some very strong psychological responses within the subconscious of the audience. For example, red is said to be a very passionate color. Blue is a very cool color. Green, lifelike. Yellow is warm, hot, and rich. Purple is said to be regal. White is said to be a pure or represent purity. What we will do with these colors is try to evoke some sort of response from the audience. If we're doing a comedy, for example, then we want our set to look very bright and cheery and warm. We might border toward the lighter pastel shades, the warm colors, the oranges, the reds. As opposed to a show with a very serious meaning, we might want to stick with the cooler colors toward the blues. These are things that we'll deal with to try to give our show an overall mood or overall feeling, even though a play might have many different moods in them, we'll deal with one overall mood, and this will help with the color scheme. What we will try to do then is to evoke this with the audience and establish our ground so that our play appears right within their subconscious mind. Before we can actually go and, and work on our colors on our set though, we really need to know a little bit about color theory. And the place to begin with color theory in our understanding is with the color wheel. There are a number of color theories. Some are very simple and some are relatively complex. For our purposes, however, a fairly simple yet practical theory of, of color is necessary for us to understand how we can use color on stage. Here we have the color wheel. Now the color wheel is made up of the basic 12 hues. And that is the first term we want to talk about, that being hue. Hue refers to the name of that particular color. It's the name that we assign it. Another term we talk about is value. Value 
deals with the lightness or darkness of a color. As it goes towards tint, which is towards white, or shade, which is towards black. Chroma refers to the intensity of a color. If it is very bright, or if it is toward the neutral gray, which refers to a weak color. Finally, we talk about tone. Tone is used to describe the combined results of what has been accomplished with hue, value, and intensity. If once again we look at the color wheel, we can see that we have three primary colors. Red, yellow, and blue. By mixing equal portions of the primary colors, we can come up with the secondary colors. If we mix equal amounts of red and equal amounts of yellow, we will come up with orange. If we mix, mix equal amounts of yellow and blue, we have the secondary color of green. If we mix equal amounts of blue and red, we will have the secondary color of violet. From these colors, we can add together to come up with the 12 hues found on the color wheel. By understanding primary and secondary colors, color theory can be a little bit more clear to you. If you would like to learn more about color theory, I would suggest reading more advanced scene design or stagecraft textbooks or even art textbooks to get into the uh, heavyweight principles involved with color theory itself. But for us, that's all we need to know. Now what I think we will do is go over to our paint table and look at some of the basic items we have there from paintbrushes to seam paints. And then we can go to actually learning how to use some of these very simple yet innovative techniques to create the illusion on stage that is required of scenic painting. What we've assembled on this paint table are some very common everyday type items that you can find locally. Uh, you don't have to buy from Chicago, New York, or Los Angeles. Uh, things that your hardware store or a Kmart or what have you, you can use on stage, can't you, when you're painting? Yeah, as a matter of fact, you can get just about everything on this table right in your own hometown. Okay, everything except for, I see we have some scene paint here, dry pigment paint, and some casein paint. What do we have here? Well, this is a uh, dry pigment paint that you can get from any theater supply house. And you mix that with some glue and some water, and the glue will hold it together so it won't flake off whatever you're painting after it dries. Uh, it's nice to use, and it's kind of neat to learn the technique, but it's not necessary. Uh, what we use mostly is a latex paint that you can buy at any hardware store. Uh, it's real good because it's water-based, which means you can wash it off with no problem, even if it's in your clothes, and it's, it's very easy to work with, and it's very inexpensive, too. Uh, the other thing you can buy from a theater supply store is uh, the casein paints, which is basically the dry pigment already mixed up for you. Uh, the reason a lot of people use this is because it's mixed to take the stage lights. It doesn't absorb as much of the light as latex does, but on the other hand, I, I still like to use latex. I don't think it makes that much of a difference. Okay, this is also a concentrated paint that can be thinned down, so this one gallon may actually make two gallons, right? Right, it will make two gallons of paint. All right, so, but you say you prefer to use the latex that's bought uh, here locally in town? Right. Because, well, I suppose any hardware store will have a good selection of colors, and if you run out, you can always go back and get some more. Mm -hmm. You don't have to wait a week or two while it's being shipped. You to don't you. have to wait for it. Plus, you wait for this. It costs 18 to $22 a gallon. So even if you get two gallons out of it, this is still more inexpensive. Oh, very good. Okay, what else do we have here, Jen? Uh, well, we've got some other things. Uh, these are some things you would use to thin down uh, various painting products. Here we have uh, acetone that you can get at your hardware store. Here we have denatured alcohol that you can get at your hardware store. Some other stuff we have here are we have some stain that you might want to use if you're using raw wood and you don't want to paint it, just stain it. Okay, here we have some shellac. If you've got something that you've painted but you want it to have a shine to it, shellac it and it'll have a nice shine. 
Some other things we have here is polyurethane. Polyurethane is great if you're painting something on a floor, like floor tile, and you don't want it to get dirty, okay? Well, it's gonna get dirty if people walk on it, so you polyurethane it. Once it dries, people can walk on it. Once it gets dirty, you can mop it without worrying about destroying your paint. It gives a hard plastic coating to whatever you paint, Right, that's, it? that's basically what it is. It's hard plastic coating. And it comes uh, dull, satin, and gloss, right? Right, mm -hmm. and depending on what kind of finish you want, you'd use that different one. Uh, something else that you can use instead of polyurethane is uh, Quick 15. Quick 15 works just like polyurethane. It's a, a hard plastic coating that will protect whatever you're painting, but the benefit is it dries in 15 minutes and you're ready to walk on it. This takes about, what, 12 to 24 hours? 12 to 24 hours. Uh, I've never had it dry in less than 18 myself. Very good. So. Now, one thing that we wanted to show you is you can see that we have here a uh, piece of marble. This marble has a nice glossy finish and to protect it, especially if you're dealing with a stage floor, you might want to coat it with a polyurethane or a Quick 15. Actually, this is nothing more than than a piece of wood that's been painted to look like marble. But yet, uh, you can see the fantastic results we can get with some of the paints that we do use uh, here. What else we have? Uh, let's see, we have some other things down here. We have a bronzing powder. Uh, what that is, is if you want true gold or true silver or a true bronze color, uh, you really can't get that in paint, so you buy the bronzing powder, mm -hmm. uh, which you mix up and paint with it. All right, bronzing powder, uh, is what they make crowns out of, uh, except instead of a binder as a wax they use in the crown, uh, this just comes in a powder form and we can uh, add it to the shellac uh, or what have you as a binder and paint it on the surface and make our own paint. Very good. We also have some dye here I noticed. We have a commercial dye, a writ dye, which you can buy at a department store or a grocery store. We have some aniline dye that comes in a crystal form. Aniline dye you may be more familiar with as Easter, eye, uh, Easter egg dye. Those little pellets are actually aniline dye that you drop in the water and it, it comes, uh, it will, it's in a crystal form and when it melts down into a liquid form then you dye your Easter eggs. Uh, we have some brushes down here that we may want to mention. First of all, we have your basic lay-in brushes or base coat brushes and those are the, the ones you're going to work with the most. I don't know if you can see that there. Let's see if we can pick up that, Chad. Okay, here we have the lay-in brush. It's a four-inch wide brush. We also have smaller ones. Here we have some lining brushes, and I have a stick here, a bamboo stick, that I can actually stick my brush into and hold it on. And then if I want to paint something at a distance, either by, if we look back at this flat, I can draw or paint a line by standing at a distance, or I can use a lining tool here we have a lining tool that we use for the floors with a, a, a pole on it. And if we hold this up like this, take our straight edge, and we'll see how to do this in a little bit here when we go to actually painting. I can paint a straight line down there. Or we have a handheld model that Jan has that we can just hold up and do smaller items. Once again, we can paint a line using our straight edge with our brush. So that's very handy to have. Here we have a stamp pad that Jad has made. You want to explain that, Jad, please? Uh, yeah, a stamp pad is kind of a neat thing. This particular one we've made is to do floor tiles for a kitchen set. Uh, it's one foot by one foot, and then we've just taken some felt. If you can see the thickness of it, it's about uh, oh, three-eighths of an inch thick. And we've cut out our pattern in it. What we'll do is we'll take the color paint we want, paint right on the felt, and then we'll merely stamp it down like this onto our pattern. And we'll have, it's just like a large rubber stamp, isn't it? Right, that's, it's, yeah, exactly like a large rubber stamp. All right, we have over here, if we look at these, we have some texturing brushes. Here we have two types of finger brushes. Uh, a finger brush is, uh, is nothing more where the actual bristles in this commercially purchased finger brush, each little finger is actually a brush in itself. And when that's dragged across the scenery, we'll get several different lines. And same with this one that we made in the shop here. The fingers themselves will hold the paint and paint onto the surface. And where we don't have fingers, of course, we won't have paint. And we can come up with some nice texturing techniques that way. Here we have uh, a, like a dry brush with a very short nap of bristles. And when we drag this across the surface, we're going to get a wood graining type of an effect. 
We also have some paint rollers here, Jed. Uh, what do we use these for mostly? Well, mostly for painting large surfaces. Uh, this is a thick napped one if you want to get some texture in it. And I can put it into the roller itself and then... Right. Then, then the handle, a handle will go on the roller okay. if you want to paint something that's high okay, up. We can, or uh, take a broom handle and, and stick it in there and then roll it, sure. Uh huh. And now how will we clean this? Well, we've got a, a paint roller cleaner here and all you do is stick the roller onto the end Okay, like and that. And grab it in the middle and you pump it up. Okay. Uh, you let your water spout start hitting here and then work down. Oh, so you do this as you spin sink. it. Uh -huh. As you spin it and it'll get most of the paint off. You I don't think I'd use rollers if I didn't have one of those as a cleaner. Okay. Uh, what have we here? This is what? Well, this is a, a texturing roller. If you put that on your roller handle, run that through your paint, you'll actually get this pattern come out on, on your flat or whatever you're painting. The surface. All right. Feather duster, what do you use that for? Well, feather dusting is really a great texturing tool for making a, uh, a wall pattern uh, is what we use it for most, although you can use it for other things on floors or whatever. Uh, we'll be showing you how to use a feather duster a little later on. Okay, good. Now, what have we on that end of the table? Well, on this end of the table, we have, let's see, a chalk line. A chalk line is what you would use to lay out straight lines if you want to, uh, if you're going to be painting tiles, for instance, you need a straight line to do it on. Uh, we'll also be using a chalk line a little later on to show you. Good. What we have here is a tool that we use then to erase the chalk line. Once it's drawn and we've used it, we want to get the chalk off the flat. This will brush it off without smearing it in. So it's kind of like a large feather duster, but that's, it's made of just that's all it is. materials. It's, it's rags that we've taped to a pole. Very good. Some other things we have here uh, are just some basic tape. If you want to paint a nice straight line that's say two inches thick on your flat here, you lie a line, lay a, a line of tape on one side, go over two inches, lay another line of tape, and just paint between it. Okay, when so it dries, it'll you, mask off. Sure. Yeah, you take mm -hmm. the paint off. We've got just a general can opener. What, we, what do we have here? This is a stencil. This is something that's made uh, pretty easily. You take some stencil paper, cut out whatever pattern you want, and then you cover it with uh, some plastic, and also you cut that out, and then you slack it a few times to make it a little stiff. You can hold it up on uh, a flat, paint inside the openings, move it down and create a really nice wallpaper pattern. We're going to be doing this a little later on, too. All right, good. We have, we have some sprayers here. Uh, first, we have a hand sprayer. And this is really nice for several different techniques. You can uh, close it up tight so you get a mist, and you can put dye in it or thin down paint and mist something over to age it or to spatter it. Uh, once again, we'll be showing you that. Then we have a couple of types of, of heavier duty sprayers. Once again, you can get all these at your hardware store. Uh, if you're covering a big area with spattering, or uh, if you want to age a big area and get that fine mist, you can use this, or the smaller version of the same. Well, good. I think uh, what we'll do then is we'll show how we use these materials we have on the table uh, individually as we go through the different techniques for creating different textures, such as marbling, spattering, feather dusting, and wood graining. So we'll go ahead and I think we'll find the first flat and, and find someone to work with. Greg here is adding the base coat or the initial color onto this particular flat. Sometimes you hear it referred to as the lay-in color or the ground color. Uh, Greg, I noticed that you were painting in X's. Do you want to explain that for us? Sure. Uh, painting in X's is a, a process called cross-hatching. Uh, it's very simple. You just go across the, your fabric and you keep making X's. Uh, the reason we want to do this instead of back and forth is because it fills the pores better and, and gives you a more even finish. Right, we want our scenery to be as evenly coated as possible. One thing we need to mention is that when we do paint scenery, uh, we have to add a texture or a surface quality to the object. When we look at something in real life, everything has a normal texture. But when we put it on stage, we have all these stage lights hitting the surface, which has a, has a tendency to wash out the item or to give it a very flat, untextured surface. We want to get an emotional response with our scenery across to the audience. We want them to think as if the scenery would feel like something, so we give it that 
texture. And that's one of the next phases that we're going to go into. So Greg will finish this and we'll step across the shop and find someone working on another project and take a look at that particular texture. Mike's pulled a flat from the rack and he's laid it down on the ground to begin texturing it and he's using a spattering technique. And Mike, why don't you describe to us what you're doing? Well, what I'm doing, Kip, is I'm uh, using some paint that's um, watered down about uh, one to one. And I'm uh, dipping the brush in the paint and getting the excess off of it, off of the brush. Just kind of standing back from the flat and using wrist action to flick the paint onto the flat. Now it's important when you're using a brush, especially when you're doing a larger area, to, um, to, to get an even coverage by going from different directions. Uh, you want to go horizontally, you want to go vertically, and you want to go on the two diagonals with your, with your spattering so that you get an even coverage on the flat. And what I'm doing now is applying the first coat. And generally you use three to four colors. Two of the colors being a variation of the base coat, one lighter and one darker. And then two other colors that mixed appropriate to the uh, mood and style of the show. And you can see right here there's some big streaks here. You want to try to avoid that when you're spattering. Try and get it even. Uh, and that didn't help. Let me go ahead and put a couple more colors on one area. You can see what it does is it gives the flat some dimension. Yeah, it gives it a textured surface quality. Now, if you wanted to, you could, if you wanted a nicer and neater quality, you could probably let each coat dry. We don't have time now for that. But between each uh, spattering coat, let it dry thoroughly, come back and spatter it again, and you'll get a, uh, probably just a more precise, cleaner look, wouldn't you, rather than puddling mm -hmm. together. Yeah. Another, um, another thing you could use, rather than a brush, especially when you have a larger area, is a small Hudson sprayer. You want to make sure you've got good pressure and pump it up. And uh, the mixture you use here would be about two parts water to one part paint. And here it takes a little bit more skill. You just step back from the flat and spray your color on. You see how that can save you a little bit of strain on your arm as well. Uh, you can also purchase larger Hudson sprayers for larger areas. Or if you've got a small area, just a simple spray bottle will do as well. Now you've done this down, but you could do it standing up, right? can do it standing up. You can get a, a little bit different texture that way. What'll happen is all the colors will run down and run together and give you a grody feel, or, you know, depending on, once again, the mood of the show. Now, if you did have an accident and you got one thick streak or you had one part heavier than another, I suppose you could come back and spatter it with your regular base coat color and that right. would even it out. And then you'll hide hide any mistakes that way. I'm going to go with the fourth color here. Now the order of your colors um, will also change the effect. If you start with a darker color and work toward a lighter color, you're going to get a lighter feel and do it the other way around, you get a darker feel. And once again, that will depend on the mood that you're going for in the particular production. I think you'll notice that uh, as a bystander, I'm standing far away from Mike. <laughs> and this is the type of thing you could do outside on the grass if you don't have a spot uh, in your theater to, to spatter with. Uh, you can really do this virtually anywhere you want. And actually, outside might be a little bit better because it uh, might dry quicker under the sunlight. And you well, see what the final result is. You good. Can... We'll come back to this after it's dry and we'll look at it standing up. Uh, meanwhile, we'll go and find another texturing technique uh, such as spattering, uh, in, uh, such as actually feather dusting, this is spattering, and we'll go there and see how that technique will work for us. A 
Liz is using another texturing technique that we uh, like to apply on flats, and this is a feather dusting technique in which we take a normal feather duster and using a pouncing pattern by applying in the paint and twisting, we can apply it to the flat surface itself. Let's see, Liz, you have another feather duster? Right, it's just an ordinary feather duster that you can buy at a... Any... You can buy it at a 5 and 10 or at mm -hmm. a grocery store or something like that. And it's nothing more than, than actually applying <clears throat> it becomes a, kind of like a paintbrush itself. We're just dipping and, and twisting. We've got and this one attached on. to a stick so we don't have to bend over quite so, we, so much. We could do this standing up. And oh yeah, yeah. Sometimes it's just easier to do it this way, um, especially if you've got a bigger flat. Um, <clears throat> we do spin it. You want to spin it to make the feathers fly out. The weight of the paint pulls the feathers out. For that reason, the paint's a little thicker than during the spattering. You wanted to water it down. This, you want to use the regular thickness of paint. And just like the flats that Mike was spattering, we're using the same colors on the mm -hmm. same color of a flat. Mm -hmm. And this gives us a much more pronounced texture than the spattering had done. And if we use the different colors, but yet the same colors that Mike was using, mm -hmm. uh, let's see what a, a light blue okay. will do on this. Okay. And I'm going to use the same feather duster because we're going to mix the colors pretty it much anyway. It doesn't really matter how they appear, does right. it? Right. Um, also, this is a good technique to cover a bad flat, a flat with bumps or maybe some glue stuck to it or maybe with some holes. That's a good point because a lot of the times flats, if you've had them around for a long time, they may get uh, kind of dog-eared and uh, have some rips that have been repaired and this will cover a multitude of sins. Also while you're using this technique you don't want to go in straight lines. Um, the idea is, is um, it's not supposed to be sy symmetrical. We want an even covering but we don't want a pattern per se. And the same thing with the spattering. If we have an area that's too heavy with one color we can always come back and and feather dust with the base coat and it kind of even things out. Well, very good. I think we'll go on to the next phase and take a look at scumbling and some stippling as yet another technique. We'll come back to this when Liz is all done with it and compare it with our spattered flat to see the difference between the two. Jad is working on yet another technique, and this technique is called scumbling. Why don't you tell us a little bit how you're approaching this, Jad? Okay, well, what I'm doing to scumble is, first of all, I'm using a cross-hatching technique like Greg, Greg showed us earlier. Uh, you can take uh, two colors or three colors or four colors and scumble them together by, while the paint's still wet, you apply one color, then you apply the other. First I applied a white to this, now I'm then I applied a black. Now I'm going over it with a little more white to blend, uh, take some of the black out, it was a little too dark. And uh, just blending it together. The more I do this, the cross hatches, the more it blends. One of the things you're really going to want to do if you use this technique is go out into the audience, look back at it. If this looks good from the audience, don't blend it anymore. But if it doesn't, blend it down so it looks like this, which is what I just did. Okay, if you can't get out to the audience, if you're not on stage, as long as you get a distance between you and the object you're, you're painting or you're texturing, that's much better. I think that's something that's important to remember all the time as far as texturing is concerned. Never be satisfied with a close-up. Step back, remove yourself from it, and you'll get a whole different perspective of, of what the object looks like. Yeah, if you know you're going to be 20 feet away, you can just measure off 20 feet or pace it off and do it. All right, now, what exactly, what kind of feel, what kind of object, what kind of look are you going to get with this particular technique? Scumbling is really great because it gives you a texture, but it's not a bold texture like spattering or feather dusting. It's more subtle. If you uh, want to do stucco, for instance, start with scumbling as your base. If you're going to do marble, scumbling would be your base. Uh, I, if you want to do adobe even, start with scumbling as your base. It just depends what colors you pick. So it gives it a kind of like a, a stone quality. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. It, gives it, that, it also gives it that natural highlights and lowlights, shadows that buildings have. All right. What else can you do to this now in addition to scumbling to give it uh, a stone appearance? Well, you can spatter over it or you can take several different types of sponges. Uh, and use these sponges to apply different colors. Like, uh, let's see, we'll take this as a natural sponge, a natural sea sponge as opposed to a kitchen sponge. So you can take this and let's say, what color should we use? How about some blue? 
Go ahead and put that on there. And you always want to tap it off, get a little of the extra off, and put it on. And as you can tell, it adds just a little bit of extra texture. Now, when you put this on, you want to vary your strokes, too, and go over it a bit. Once again, spin your hand like you would if you were feather dusting. It gives you more of a random pattern than a planned pattern, I think. Yeah, and depending on the size of your sponge and the shape of it, you can get all kinds of different textures out of it. On the kitchen sponge, it's good for some other things like bricks, which you'll see in a little while. You'll get to see uh, the kitchen sponge being used in stippling. Uh, some other things you can do just to get different textures is a newspaper, and a newspaper works really well. You just need to have some paint you can dip the newspaper in, kind of just crumple it up, roll it around in there, and you can get a really kind of neat different texture with it. I've got a piece of newsprint here, but newspaper, any kind of paper that'll crinkle up really can give you a nice texture. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see, what else do I have here? I have an old rag here. Once again, an old rag will work good. Um, once again, give yourself some paint to dip it in, roll the rag around in it, and uh, you can get a texture with it, too. I think Just what Jed's pointing out to us is that you really shouldn't be afraid to try different techniques, to try different objects, because anything that will hold paint can be used as uh, an applier. And uh, you can come up with some very interesting type of uh, uh, different looks, different qualities, different surface qualities uh, for your stage purposes, can't you? Yeah, you really can. And uh, an old rag doesn't cost a penny. That's right. OK, very good. Well, thanks, Jed. You're welcome. Greg's working with a technique which is commonly referred to as stippling. And here he's making a brick wall on a piece of styrofoam that's been base coated and chalk lined off. By chalk lined off, we mean we've measured every two and a half inches, drawn a line with our chalk line and snapped it off, and now he can keep his line straight. Now, Greg, what else have you done here? Okay, uh, the, the distance between the chalk lines is approximately two and a half inches. Uh, you want to leave at least uh, half of an inch to three quarters of an inch in between your brick lines. So, so you have to measure uh, the size of the sponge you're going to use. Um, because, of course, whenever you do bricks, there's always the mortar space in between. And it also leaves you space to uh, highlight and low light your bricks. This is nothing more than a household sponge you can buy at any grocery store or five and ten or hardware mm -hmm. store, right? And if you buy uh, the thick ones like this, you can just cut them in half as we did here, and that way you can stretch your pennies. Okay, with you that. apply that on a piece of wood so that you can do many rows at one time? Yeah, it's just connected with uh, paneling adhesive, and then uh, it's just some scrap one by three that we had with uh, um, handles on it. Okay, let's see how you do it now. Okay, you have to make sure, as you can see here, that you stagger the bricks, because uh, when you build a house, you stagger the bricks. It's very simple. And then you just press down. If you press down too hard or put too much paint on, it might smear it. Now, see, it, it came out really nice here. Uh, uh, it shows the, uh, the pores from the, uh, the sponge show the pores that would be in a brick. So it gives it a nice, really brick-like appearance. So how would you do the Very end nice. down here? Uh, on that, you would just take uh, the end of a single sponge, put paint across it, and then just uh, fill it in like that and texture it. Now, to get your highlight and low light, because, of course, whenever you do any texturing, especially uh, with bricks or wood, light is coming from one direction or another. Here, let's say the light is coming from this direction. So the bottom of the brick would be darker. And if we can apply a little black to this. And then the top of the brick, then, would be uh, white or a lighter color of the base coat that we're using for the brick. Now, you can see here with this sponge that we've gouged out one edge of it because uh, the black, the darkness, the shadow wouldn't be all the way around the brick. It would just be on one corner since our light is coming from this direction. And it's very simple. You just line this up and press it down. It's really just pushing the sponge onto the surface and that becomes yeah. your plier, doesn't it? It's very quick. Now you can always just go one by one mm -hmm. and do it too, but it's much quicker if you apply it to this because then you can just do a large section at one time. I suppose you could uh, paint different bricks, different colors now and go on back on top of those 
uh, to get the old appearance bricks. Right mm -hmm. now, this might be a very plain, very simple brick pattern, but to give it older appearance, a more stylized type of realistic effect. Yeah. And it? it would give it more depth also. Right. Well, let's try that out and see if we can try okay. uh, maybe a little bit of, of white on here, just to uh, see how easy okay. it actually is. Let's try a little pink too. Okay. It's not important to uh, clean the sponges each time you use it because since you're going to be blending it together anyway, you can just paint right over top of it. As you can see, my color of the paint when it comes out of the paintbrush is very bright when it goes on the sponge, it changes color a little bit. That's not really important to worry about that. Go on top of another row, yeah. Well, it does. It, it's very subtle. And then I suppose you could take uh, even, even another uh, sponge if you wanted something that was really uh, bright and stood out from the rest of them. And let's see if I can paint this on and try it out. Okay, let's see how this works. I'll do this top brick right here. And you can see that really gives it a nice appearance, maybe with some mm -hmm. yellow, maybe some orange. Uh, you can come up with a natural looking appearance. And this could be rather fast, especially if uh, you had a whole series of these you had to do with this, wouldn't it? Oh, yeah. It's a, a, extremely expedient. Now, if you wanted bigger size bricks, cinder blocks, for example, I suppose you could have uh, patterns like that as well? Oh, yes, it, uh, because the sponges come in a variety of sizes, and you can even cut them to fit the, the correct size. So you're really only limited by your imagination or what you can right. find. That's very good. Okay, very good. Thanks, Greg. Mike's using a stamp that we showed you earlier in the video. Uh, maybe you can explain to us the exact procedure, Mike. Okay, Kip. Um, what I'm doing here is making a uh, tile floor. And uh, the first thing you want to do when making a tile floor is grid out your tiles. And that's easily done simply by measuring, the, depending on the size of your tile, in this case, uh, a foot by a foot. You measure off a foot down one side, a foot down the other, and the same in the other direction, and if you'll assist me a moment, you want to chalk line it off. Now, we've already chalk lined this, but just to give you an idea of what it's like, um, the chalk line can be purchased at any hardware store. You simply line up your chalk line to the marks on either side and snap it. Now, as you might also notice, we've got a little bit of excess chalk on there that uh, could possibly smear and create uh, ugliness on your floor. And that's what this is for. I believe it was explained earlier in the tape. It's just a thing to help clean off some of that excess chalk that might be on there. Yeah, so the chalk won't go actually into the paint. Right. Uh, and then from there, you want to line, you want to line off your tiles with a black line. And this is done by using a, a line guide or it's a straight edge on a stick. You line that up close to your chalk line. And then you take a, a line brush. This one's attached to the end of a stick, so you don't have to bend over and hurt your back. And I've just got a little bit of black uh, paint mixed in with some water. You just butt up next to your edge and paint your line. You notice it's not going solid. You might want to go twice on it. I think it's important to show that this lining tool was made, and all it is is a board with some plywood attached to the bottom of the board so that when this does rest upon the surface, these two pieces of board or wood rest on the surface, whereas the board doesn't. And that way, when you move this, manipulate this onto the board or the flat surface you're on, you won't actually get paint onto the surface because the paint is removed by this spacing piece. Okay, the next step is to take and apply paint to the paint stamp. Now this is uh, just a homemade paint stamp. Just a piece of one by one plywood with uh, some felt, 3 8 thick felt attached to the 
front of it in the pattern desired. And a uh, two by two stick placed on the other side. And you just apply your paint to the felt, making sure to get your excess out of the insides there so you don't drip. And once you've applied your paint, you simply go to a square, line it up, and you've got your stamp. Now on this one, we're using uh, three different colors on each square, just to give it some dimension, some three dimension. And we're using a pink and a white and a black. You don't have to go real heavy with the second coat, so you're just adding some texture. And finally. Really looks very easy. It's real simple. And this type of paint stamp has you know, several applications. You can use it for just about anything that you need a, a pattern for. Use it for a wallpaper pattern. Use it for a linoleum tile or... It could be a rug pattern. Be a rug pattern. You can make it any size you want. I guess you're only limited by your imagination. Right. Oh, yeah, that's, that's really very nice looking. Well, thanks, Mike. We'll go take a look next and see what we can come up with in terms of wood graining and dry brushing effects. Jad's working on some wood graining effects for the stage, and apparently he's working with a wet blending, and Jad, why don't you tell us exactly what you're doing? Okay, what we're making here is a backyard fence. What we've done to start with is we've taken our unit and base coated it in a canary yellow. Then we've taken some dark brown, and while the yellow's still wet, I've dragged the brown across it to blend it in, just very lightly. This is what it looks like when it's wet, and then when it dries, it uh, looks more like this. So this is giving us our base board. Now what we want to do is we want to come around and line it into separate boards so we can actually see the crack uh, between each board. So we're going to use our lining tool that we've been using. This tool is perfect for this because the board that this is made out of is the width of the boards we want to make. So it's very easy to do. We set that in place. We take a thick black marker. We draw our line. So then we've got our actual crack. Now, how did you get these, uh, the wood grain actually here on these? Because I notice they're different here than they are on those. Okay, yes. We want to, what we do now is take what we've got and add a deeper grain to it so it's really going to read from off stage and the audience can tell it's wood. What we use is our finger brush. As we showed you before, we have the commercially bought one or the one we've made. I like the one we've made better. It's a little easier to handle. It's a little more flexible. We're going to take a little bit of reddish brown and a little bit of black paint. We'll start with the reddish brown. And we're going to drag it across with the finger brush pretty lightly. Now, of course, you've got to be careful. You don't want to put too much on or, it's, or you're going to have to blend it out. And you don't want to put too little on or it might not read. So you have to uh, experiment with it and come up with what you like for this particular set or, or unit. So here we've got our red. And lightly we'll finger brush on some black. And you might still say, well, gee, that doesn't look anything like that. Well, okay, now we have to do the final piece, and that's just take some water, some plain old water and another brush, and we're going to blend it all in together. Get some water on your brush.
and come across it in streaks. And you want to go back. And I always try to do this so that I uh, keep the streak going all the way across the board. And then we've got our basic thing. Now there's some other stuff we can do to it. As you can tell, I've done that pretty straight, whereas these have some waves in them. If you want to create the waves, because wood isn't always straight, when you're dragging it along, merely wave your brush, your blending brush, a little bit. And you've got some added waves and dimension to your board. And it's nice to see that the three boards you have drawn on there already, or painted on there already, they're three distinctly different boards. They're not all the same. Right, because all, all wood is not the same. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's basically what we're going to be doing to this entire piece. I've got some other stuff I wanted to show you, okay, though, too. Okay, good. Fine. I've got a piece of cornice here. What we're going to do with this cornice is do the same type of thing, except I'm going to show you a couple different things. We're going to first dry brush it, and you can see how dry brushing would look on a unit on stage. Then we're going to go ahead and wet blend it so you can tell the difference. Once again, we've base coated this with our brown. And we're going to take a little bit of this reddish tone, draw it across there. Then a little bit of our black. This gives it a nice rustic appearance. Now I've just drawn those across there and I haven't done any blending on them, so this is more of a dry brushing effect where you just put the paint on it and don't go ahead and wet blend them together. Uh, it sticks out a little more. It uh, doesn't blend together quite as much. So if you don't want it to stick out that much, say you're in a small space where the audience is only five or ten feet away, then you can go ahead, drag your water brush across it once. And it takes a little bit of that harsh grain out. Now, and I've noticed that you're doing both of these while they're down on the ground. Could they be done while they're up in the air or standing up? or? or yes, they could. Better? As long as uh, you've got it standing in the right direction, it's fine. If the paint bleeds down a little bit, it, it's going to just add to the texture of the wood. All right. Now, on this, after this is completely dry, you can go back and highlight and shadow each side of the line so that it would look more natural like it's actually real wood. Right. It's Once it's dry, we just want to take some thin black paint, use our straight edge again, and draw a thin black line on whichever side we uh, want to make the shadow on. Okay, and then a highlight line or a lighter line like it's actual crisp line on the opposite side. Right, on the opposite side, and then you've got a shadow okay, and a highlight. Fine. Uh, something else I wanted to show you was uh, a lot of people think if they're going to put real wood on stage, well, it looks like real wood, you don't have to do anything to it. But if your audience is far away, they might not be able to read it as real wood, and it might look a little fake. So there's a couple things you can do. Uh, if you can see this, you can take some bright color, like some yellow or possibly some red, and just lightly finger brush down it. And it's going to make the pores stick out a little bit and the whole grain stick out on the wood some. Now, once again, this is the dry brushing method. It's just brushed on. If you want to blend it in, you can blend it in like this, and this still gives the highlights and shadows of the wood. But as you can tell, it sticks out a whole lot more than just the flat wood would. Yeah, bare wood on stage really doesn't work out very well, does it? Because Now I've got something else to show you back here that we pulled out a little earlier. This is a uh, bar unit for the next show coming up. We've wood grained it and wet blended it using blacks, whites, and grays. And as you can tell, it looks real nice, and it looks old and a little weathered. And that's why we use those particular colors. Very good. Well, next I think we're going to work specifically with this unit and some other units on glazing to give it a nice finished quality. Even though it may be rustic, we want to bring out the grain a little bit by adding a glazing compound to that. We'll check into that next.
Liz is working on this unit we were worked on before, and what she's doing is glazing uh, the front side here, and I notice you're using three different colors down here. Liz, you want to tell us what? Well, we've got shellac in three different cans. We've added some green dye to the first can. This is, of course, clear shellac, and then we've got some brown dye added to the last can. This is so we can get a little more variation in our different pieces of wood because no two pieces of wood would be exactly alike. Right, uh-huh. Mm -hmm. And it will take, when you're all done working on this unit and you go with the three different colors, uh, we'll clean this out with denatured alcohol because this is shellac. Right, right. Mm -hmm. right. Also, the shellac helps to bring out the grain a little bit more, gives it a little more of a finished appearance. Right. Okay. Over here, we have um, a flat that's been spattered, like we saw earlier. We've lined it out with the lining tool, like before. Now, we're using a light source coming from this direction, falling down, and so we've created some highlights from the light with a watered down paint solution and just painted it in here where the light would have hit. Now, to create the shadows, we've mixed some dye with a lot of water, very watered down again, and so we've got our shadows and our highlights to create the effect of light. Right. That's one thing we want to stress. When, when you're working with surfaces that would have a natural three-dimensionality to it, and we want to show that to the audience, what we try to do is to always consider where the light source is coming from, whether it's from the sun or a window or a lamp on the wall, and then taking the light source from that point and then bringing it down and accenting it by using either a highlight or a shadow line on the objects, and that's what Liz was describing to us here. What else do we have, Liz? Okay, over here we have some marble that um, is going to be used as part of a floor. And so we want to protect this because people will be walking on it. So we're going to use Quick 15, which will protect it. Um, the advantage to this product is it dries in about 15 minutes. So you could use a polyurethane, but a polyurethane takes a lot longer to dry. Right. right. Um, however, this has very strong fumes like polyurethane, like, like the shellac I was using. So you want to have a well-ventilated room. But this will help to protect it. It also helps to bring out the paint underneath, shows it a little more. Um, this way we can sweep up after the actors have been on stage. If anything gets spilled on it, we can mop it up. It, it basically protects it and waterproofs it. All right. Okay. Now down here we have the bricks that Greg was working on earlier. And the mortar between the bricks um, is pretty flat. The bricks themselves are well textured. But we want to bring out the mortar, make it look less painted. So I've got a solution of dye mixed up here, dye and water. Um, the dye is very concentrated, so it doesn't take much at all. And squirt out a little bit to clear my nozzle and just lightly dust it. Okay. Now those drops aren't going to hurt the surface, are they? No, um, dye is very translucent. Once it dries, it's, you can... You can see through it. So it actually looks like uh, the regular stone, the mortar, or what have you. Right. Uh -huh. um, as far as bricks or stone, you really can't overdo okay. the texture. And what about on this floor here? Uh, maybe we should hold that up so That's we can see that, what it looks okay. like. There. And you can see where we've sprayed the dye in between here and get a little more texture on the actual mortar. Okay, that's nice, yeah. Well, now, what will we do with this unit here? <clears throat> well, we've got the same problem over here. Um, this is the floor that Mike was stamping out. The um, base coat is still very flat, very um, untextured. So we're going to spray that a little more. Now, will you want the same drops or you want that thinner? Would you close the nozzle? Well, if we want the bigger drops, we open it up a little mm -hmm. more. To make the thinner drops, we close it and we get a finer mist. Now, the mist will take more of appearance of dirt then, right? Like right. Like built up soot. Mm -hmm. And that just gives us a little more texture. And again, when this dries, it'll be more clear. A yeah, I think you so. can tell the difference between the side that has some of the dye textured on it and some of the clear side over here, which doesn't have anything on it yet. And when we do the whole thing, we could even put around where a, a table might be, a chair might be, uh, a counter might be, and make it look more like soot and what have you. Yeah, that looks very nice. 
And then after this is dry, we'd want to protect it also with the Quick 15 so we could clean it up if okay. anything got stuck. Now, the Quick 15, you couldn't clean with denatured alcohol like you could the shellac. You'd have to use something like acetone or uh, mineral spirits, right? Mm -hmm. okay. uh, one other thing I might mention, when you're using dye, you might want to use gloves because if it drips on your hands, it does take a while to clean up. And you want to keep it off your clothes because this is a clothing dye. Very good. Thank you very much. Mike's working on a wallpaper pattern that we've developed for on this particular flat for a show. Tell us a little bit about it, Mike. Well, Kip, what we've done is we've made a stencil pattern. And uh, the way this was made, it, it was made on or out of a uh, oak tag paper. And the pattern was traced or drawn onto the paper. From there, it's cut out with a mat knife or an X-Acto blade. And then in order to ensure the protection of the pattern, it's quick 15 on both sides, and uh, you need to protect it from damage. It can get ripped, or it can get soaked with water and, and become marred, or, and, or it can just get damaged from the paint itself. So once it's been protected, um, you apply the pattern to the flat. Now you'll notice we've snapped out two chalk lines. They're uh, one foot apart, and these chalk lines are lined up to the um, guides that are pre-cut in the stencil. There's, you'll notice there's two guides on the top and two on the bottom. Now once you line your guides up to the chalk lines, from there it's, it's merely a matter of painting in the stencil. Now here we're using a spray paint. I think it's a black spray paint. Um, you don't have to use a spray paint. You can use a uh, regular latex paint. Um, you can use um, a normal brush or a stencil brush. But what you want to make sure of is that you don't, um, you don't put too much paint on your brush because you um, risk dripping or um, blotching on your stencil. When you're spray painting, you don't need to go heavy. Just a light coat. Once you've done it once, then you merely take off your stencil pattern, and we're going to line it up so that the top of this meets with the bottom of that. Just continue down the flat, and once again, lining it up to the chalk lines, taking it down. And proceeding to paint again. I guess that's more of a gray. And as you can see, if you were to carry on the pattern all the way down and all the way up, you'd have a wallpaper pattern. And you can go ahead and, with whatever width you want, go ahead and snap out more lines. And alter your wallpaper accordingly. Mm -hmm. There are commercial wallpaper stencils that you can buy at a, that are kind of small, but you can buy them from hobby shops and craft shops. Uh, or you can buy uh, some books with wallpaper patterns in them from Dover Publications, very inexpensive books. Or you can go to the library, and the library will have sections just on stenciling and wallpapering. And this is really a very effective, very inexpensive, and really a nice looking way to achieve walls and wallpaper on stage. Greg's working on our next project to put on stage, and that's a slab of marble that's going to be made from styrofoam. Would you like to tell us a little bit more about the project, Greg? Okay, first we base coated it and, and allowed the base coat to dry, and then uh, I just finished going over it with water, just putting a very light coat on it. And what that does is enable the paint as we put it on to mix and flow together a little more, and it also uh, smooths out easier from your paintbrush. 
uh, we'll go ahead and start. We'll start with the little red. Now, the color choice that you use for this really doesn't matter. What you can do is uh, go into a book and find it from the library, uh, find a picture of a marble that you think would work well for the set or the scene that you're going to use. And then by using that picture, choose your color scheme. Okay. Start out here with red. You uh, have to move throughout the entire sheet. Uh, I didn't get quite enough paint on my brush that time. And you can either let it dribble or you can smear it. And uh, you want to try to work for that veining that uh, you see in marble. Yeah, probably the quicker you work, the uh, more effective your, your, your marble will be. Yeah, and you kind of have to follow the way that the paint is, is uh, wanting to move with it. This also will probably take a little longer than uh, a regular painted uh, piece of scenery to dry because we're layering it so much and the water on it underneath makes it difficult for air to get to to dry. So probably you'll want to put a fan on it uh, depending upon when you need it. Yeah, marble comes in all sor sorts of colors and marble is very dramatic and therefore nice to use on stage because you can do some fun things with it. And you really have to let the paint work for you. I think we'll try a little brown here, too. And then uh, another item that can work well with this is uh, bronzing powder. Now you can buy this from either a theater supply house or uh, some hardware stores have them. Uh, but you really have to call around for it uh, to find it. Not everyone carries this. It also comes in steel and uh, silver, chrome. And then another thing you, you can do with it, uh, especially if you're working with slabs, you can pick it up and allow it to run, and that helps the veining a little more. Okay, Maybe we let's can... see. You can see how it's starting to run now. And that's from the layering of the paint, because the water is also, uh, the paint is also watered down, uh, roughly either one to one or two to one, to help it move around also. Now, what would happen if you were to add some water on top of this now? Let, maybe we can try this and uh, see what effects we're coming up with. This is looking very interesting. Okay. Uh, let's try a little water, uh, splattering with just a little bit of water. Maybe on to where the gold is. Okay. And now if we hold it up again, and maybe going in a different direction this time. You can see that's starting to add the veins a lot better. Uh, it looks like we went a little heavy with the, uh, the watered down paint, especially the brown at the far end by you. Okay, then to correct that, maybe we can just take a little bit more and let's see what colors we have. Maybe a little bit of red. And by very simply in no particular pattern, 
And what you're doing is placing more veins into it because it was just a little too solid. Maybe dribbling a little bit. Okay. And once again, I think when this is all dry, and then we would go on top of it with uh, a polyurethane or a quick 15, give it a nice sheen to it, it would look very dramatic. This would just be another type of marble that we've uh, uh, worked on uh, through, you know, many shows will call for different types of things and this is just something else you can try to use. We're about at the end of our video on painting and I thought maybe we would like to review some of the things we've talked about today. The first thing we showed you was taking a normal flat and base coating it. By base coating we mean we're putting on the initial lay-in color, filling all the pores using a cross-hatch stroke that will actually fill up the pores much quicker and easier and give us a much better surface quality for us to texture on. When we began our texturing, we began with spattering. Spattering was the technique of dipping the paintbrush into the paint and then using a throwing motion, throwing the drops of paint onto the flat surface. Remember that we always spatter in four directions, horizontally, vertically, and in both directions, diagonally. Also, we used four colors in our spattering technique. We also used four colors in our feather dusting technique. Feather dusting was where we took a normal everyday feather duster, which you can buy commercially at your grocery store or five and 10, dipped it in the paint, and then with a twirling motion, pounced it onto the flat surface, coming up with an interesting, bolder pattern, much more bold than we have with our spattering. Here we have an example of scumbling. This is where we wet blended the paint, a uh, gray, a black, and a white together to come up with a more or less stucco or stone appearance. Scumbling is good to use for a number of things. It's also good to use as an undercoat for things such as stippling, where you can take sponges and add extra texture on top of it, which we showed you with papers, newspapers, rags, animal sponges, and a normal synthetic sponge. We also took synthetic sponges and stippled bricks onto this particular surface. What we did here was we put several sponges onto a board, and then by measuring off and chalk lining off the surface, we applied the sponge to the surface of the flat, and it became a, a like brick appearance. After we did that, we also went around and on each sponge we highlighted and low lighted, giving us shadow lines. And then finally we sprayed it with a little bit of dye to give it a much more natural stone appearance. Here's our example of taking a piece of oak, oak tag, cutting it out in a stencil pattern, and then applying that to a flat surface by use of a spray can. You could also apply the paint through the stencil by use of a brush, a rag, a sponge, or a, a regular airbrush type spray can, which is a little bit different than an aerosol spray can. This was our stencil. On this end, we have an example of our wood graining, dry brushing, and wet blending. What we did here was we wet blended a brown and yellow base coat onto this surface, and then after we lined it off using a marker, we went back and on each plank that we had drawn in, we applied a dry brush technique and then wet blended on top of that to give us a wood appearance for a backyard fence. We also highlighted and low-lighted each line to give it a much more three-dimensional appearance. Down here, we have our stamp. Remember, we made our stamp on a piece of plywood using a piece of 3 inch, inch uh, felt, cut it out to the pattern, and using a, a stamping pattern, applied it onto the surface. We had chalk lined and drew our lines in a more or less of a, a steady or standard tile fashion, could be called linoleum at the same time, 
And this is the look that we got when we applied three or four different colors. Lastly, down here, we have our example of marbling. Here's where we puddled and we wet blended and we applied many layers of different color paints onto a surface and then added bronzing powder. We picked it up, we let it run, we let it drip. We tried to create veins. And after we were all done, we applied a very shiny, high gloss, quick 15 coat to give it a much natural, shiny marble appearance. I should also point out that when we marble or when we use a spray can, when we use things that have a rather strong vapor, we need to be in a well-ventilated well area or we must wear a protective face mask to protect us from the fumes. Finally, I think it might be a good idea if we actually go out onto one of our stages and look at a completed set. It might be nice to see how we can take all of these painting techniques and apply them into one particular setting and see actually the end results of all our labors. Here we are on stage on the set, the completed set for the play Harvey. I must first point out that this is a really very simple set. It's not very elaborate. And really, for you uh, just beginning out, it's probably better to stay with the simplicity more than it is to get into the things that are a little bit more elaborate. We have on this particular completed set all the painting techniques that we showed you in the scene shop, with the exception of one or two. One of the first techniques to talk about is the base coat painting. Here we have a dusty rose and a light gray. These were applied first to the flats after they were uh, built and sized, and then we've come on top of it with the texturing techniques. This particular texturing technique is a masked spattering technique that we showed you in the shop. We've gone with the basic four colors in the spattering process. In addition to the spattering process, we've also applied a wallpaper type of stencil, as you can see here. The stenciling actually has two uh, colors on it, a uh, darker red and then a, a gray, to give it a little bit more of an aged effect. Also on the walls, to give the, the entire stage setting a little bit older uh, appearance, we've used some dye to darken down some of the top corners, some of the edges around the pictures, to show a little bit more age. Another technique that we used is on all the woodwork molding. Although most of it is made out of styrofoam, we needed to paint it so that it looked like wood. What we've used here was the very basic dry brushing technique that we have showed you in the shop, and then glazed it with a light varnish to give it a, a slight sheen. The fireplace that we see here although made of uh, styrofoam, is actually painted to look like a wood grain effect on the outer edge. And then the interior is painted with a marbling effect that we discussed in the shop, and then glazed with a, a varnish so that it would have a slight sheen to it and create that illusion that we talk about all the time. Some of the other techniques we apply on stage outside of the painting are some of the dressing effects that we really uh, use quite often so that we can get that finished quality, what I call the environment that a family actually lives within this dwelling. All the little knickknacks, these are things that you have uh, easily at your disposal. All you have to do is go in and dig them up uh, from either a prop storage room or from your living room or what have you to borrow. The plants you see are all artificial, they're not real. If they were real, I'm afraid they would die under stage lights. Also, plants, if they're real, don't carry. They don't read on stage. So we can highlight these plants with paint, painting techniques with a dusting of what have you, one certain color, to create a nice popping out of the plant itself. Over here, we have styrofoam books. Now, if we were to put actual books on stage, they'd be quite heavy, quite massive, be very uneasy for us to deal with. Actually, by styrofoam being lightweight, we have to paint them so they do look like real books. We recreate that illusion of reality here, and then we can proceed with other items. We've just shown you some very basic scene painting techniques. We have what we call in the theater the illusion of reality. 
What the audience sees and what we actually have on stage are two different things. Yet through the process of scene painting, we recreate that illusion of reality. So that styrofoam bookcases look real. So that a styrofoam fireplace is painted to look like marble. We use all the techniques we've talked about in this video to recreate the look of reality that you see in our stage setting. All the paint that we've used can be found locally at your hardware stores, and any student or any teacher with a little bit of practice can examine some of the techniques that we used and create that illusion of reality by themselves. Hopefully, through this video, we have answered your question now, how do I paint it? Thank you.